Good morning. I'm Dr. Rachel Burks from St. Edwards University in Austin, Texas, and I have a confession. I did not want to be a scientist when I was little. I wanted to be a lawyer. I was that Alex P. Keaton kid that had like a little briefcase and I wore suits on Saturday and I went to the library and I read law books. So I was a lot of fun when I was little. Okay. Uh, I did not want to be a scientist because I did not see why it would be practically useful. Yeah, I grew up in the shuttle era and that's great. Space. I was not tempted by space and I did not see the practical application of science until I had a great trip to Washington, D.C. that showed me the power and reach of STEM. So we have real world problems and we have real world needs. And it was on a trip uh, that it was a science interaction during D.C. where someone posed a real challenge. And the only way to solve it was going to be a combination of chemistry, biology, engineering, um, and to then leverage all of these skills together and do a series of tests. And we know now, fast forwarding uh, several years, date myself a good 20, uh, that real world problems and applied research is a great way to hook students and get them involved in STEM. And it's also a way to retain our students. We have big challenges that we need to meet. And introducing students to applied research and real world needs can do that very early and keep them interested. Applied research also offers them an opportunity to get a multitude of skill sets. But just because you do applied work doesn't mean you escape basic research. Anyone who does applied work knows that you need a strong foundation in basic research and it will come back to haunt you if you try to shortcut it. In my lab, we're trying to both hook students into STEM and keep them in STEM, so two different missions, recruitment and retention. And this is how I do that. I'm lucky enough to be involved in an SPIR grant through the US Army. And we are working on a reconnaissance sampling kit, really to test for and be able to detect a whole range of different weapons classes, and so that they can make command decisions on the field. Of course, this is translatable work because, as we've seen in recent events for the last few years, uh, we need to be able to do this type of detection on our own soil. So our, my students, uh, right away, as soon as I tell them about my research project, they see the absolute hook there, right? They're drawn in. They see a way to help our fighting forces, a way to keep civilians safe while also doing STEM research. My particular part of this project is colorimetric and fluorescence testing. So you know if you've ever Googled chemist and got a stock image and there's someone gazing at a brightly colored liquid? That's literally what we do, <laughs> legit. And, that's, and students love that because they all have had selfies updated on various social media profiles of them staring at brightly colored liquids and saying, this is real. Okay. So it's a great way to hook students in. Now this is good old fashioned solid bench chemistry, right? wet chemistry, the foundation of analytical sciences. So you're gonna have in my lab a good background in doing bench chemistry and talking about electronic transitions and getting experience with spectroscopy. So that's a lot of skills and exposure right there, right? But that's not very portable. So we're gonna have to make that better. And one way that we do that in my lab is we re-engineer commercially available printers and we fabricate solid phase arrays. And we package these up in little kits. But we want to keep the price point down. I used to work in a crime lab, and I know that the budget of the lab I worked in was half for the year of one episode of CSI. Okay. And we didn't even get cool sunglasses. <laughs> so I know that we've got to keep our price per unit low, right? especially in developing nations. We need to make products that they can use in extreme temperatures, as we heard from our previous speaker, as well as making them affordable. So if you're in my lab, you're going to learn how to do this technology and engineering as well. Okay. Now, we want to dial up our analysis because color tests and fluorimetry and noticing a change is good, but it would be better if we can quantitate it, 
if we could do advanced multivariate statistics and have more confidence in our identifications. And that's where we start doing image analysis. Okay. And not just with your conventional cameras. This is actually a picture of an app that we have in development so that we can leverage a portable device that many folks would already carry. As we heard from a speaker yesterday, we have to lighten the load. They already carry a lot of gear. So if we can leverage something that they're already carrying and just add a slight addition, that would be best. Okay. Now, you can see in this last part, though, that's going to involve what skill set? Computation, programming. Okay. Most chemists don't go through a BS in chemistry and get that skill set. So I have to provide that for my research students. The way I do that is by leveraging a completely different program I'm co-PI on from NSF I use. This is Improving Undergraduate Education. The project is called DIVAS because we love our acronyms. Okay. In this program, we consider it an on-ramp to computation. The framework is we're all doing image analysis and advanced statistical analysis, and we've got to train our students and find a way to give them this skill set. So we do that with the DIVAS program, and we do that in a couple different ways. We have a seminar that they're involved with during the academic year. This also has a bonus of introducing them to a cohort. We do not work alone. That kind of image of a scientist, of a crazy-haired white guy working in a basement needs to change. I still have crazy hair, but I work in a large team, and we work with lots of different people at multiple institutions. We have support mechanisms. So be, being involved in a seminar, they realize that there's power in the team. And we are working to solve these problems together. So they have a seminar experience. Then to kick off our summer research, we do an image analysis and Python boot camp. Faculty and students are in the room together, learning new skills and solving problems. Then we have our course modules. So we've introduced image analysis and programming into our basic biology, chemistry, physics, computer science. We're hitting them on a lot of different areas so that they can get lots of exposure. It's no longer seen as like, oh, I have to go over to computer science to learn that. No, that is part of chemistry. It's part of biology. And they're learning those skills very, very early. The other thing that we do is undergraduate research. So we all have a variety of projects that we're working on. So this grant that I'm involved in with DIVAS is not just chemistry. It also is biology, computer science. We've got a lot of folks involved with it. But the core framework is we all have to take good images. So here's a scanner that actually a couple of us use. Um, one of us actually looks at maize corn root growth. Here's a picture of a different sensor set that I arranged. And then, of course, there is our virtual machine and a coding window open to show that we are all kind of tackling this in the same way. This is also a great thing to expose students to because you have a lot of different people working on a variety of projects. But what's the common feature? Images, computation. Even though the applications may be different, we're solving our problems in the same way so we can come together and help each other and strategize. The other thing that we do is we meet twice a week. We update each other on our projects, our coding successes, our coding failures. People can share code on our Slack channel so that everybody, it's a big kind of group coding space. We are, and we're also showing them that this technology space, this startup culture, if you will, can be supportive and mission driven. So how successful are we? The thing we're also doing is studying, are our techniques, are our interventions, are they successful? This was actually the first year of this grant, and, but we partnered with a collaborator in sociology and education to look at, are we having any effect and what effect could we be having? And what we found is that students that were involved in the DIVAS grant were seeing positive shifts, statistically significant shifts, in their evaluation of their own self-efficacy. They felt that their computational thinking skills and critical thinking skills were going up. And perhaps more importantly to me too, 
is that their positive associations with the STEM career went through the roof. Now this wasn't just for folks in the boot camp or that were involved in full-time undergraduate research. This was also for students who just completed one course activity. They saw the utility of it, they saw the power of it, and we hooked them in, which I think is really great. So in my lab, we're using these two projects. I'm using the Army work to really hook the students in, and also our NSF education grant to provide them the skills and the tools and the supportive environment to actually enable their success. It's not enough to get them there. We have to keep them there. And this is how I'm trying to do that. I'd like to thank my great group. The big picture is our Big Divas group. And the small picture is my research students. Uh, and I look forward to working with them again. They've all been with me for at least a year. And fools that they've are, they've signed up for year two. So thank you.